Did you know Higher Ed's premier tech conference, Elucian Live, is almost here. Join industry leaders in New Orleans, March 26th through 29th. Discover insights and game-changing solutions to unlock possibility and drive student success. Register at elive.elucian.com. Epic. Three higher ed authors, 100 plus college and university presidents, dozens of actionable insights for academic leaders. Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education is now available on Amazon. Welcome back, everybody. It's your time to add up on the EdUp Experience podcast where we make education your business. Dr. Joe Salustio back with you on another episode. It will not ever stop. Ladies and gents, we will continue to have the most engaging conversations in and around higher education by bringing you guests that you need to hear from. But before I get to that, that's a nice lead in, by the way. Before I get to that, I do want to thank all of you who have supported Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education, um, the book, and I'm going to give you guys a little bit of fact because I found this exciting. Of course, you know, the book is um, out on the market. You can find it on Amazon, but we have had sales in multiple countries. And today I was pulling our Amazon stats and I was like, oh, wow, this is pretty cool. So US, Canada, United Kingdom, India, Germany, Brazil, France, Netherlands, Mexico, and Australia. There are people out there with copies of Commencement, which makes us, I think it makes us global. So I'm so happy to uh, be contributing to the higher education conversation in this way. And you know, I'm going to uh, I'm gonna thank you guys each and every single time I get in this podcast because I am so honored by your support and, and humbled by your support of, of the book and of the podcast. Uh, today, I, this is a really personal episode for me because I happen to be talking to somebody that I respect immensely but somebody that I get to see often that's involved with what I'm doing at a high level and has lots of opinion on higher education. I'm going to tell you this story in a minute, but let me bring him in, ladies and gentlemen, because he's got a long title and I got to get through it. Here he is. He's Don Tuttle. He's co-founder and managing partner of Top Gun Ventures LLC and happens to also be the chairman of the board at Lindenwood University. Don, how are you? Joe, thank you uh, for the invite. I'm, I'm great in yourself. Oh, another day in paradise for me, Don. I get to work at Lindenwood University and talk to the chairman of the board and co-founder and managing partner of Top Gun Ventures, which really is the primary reason we're talking today is because we, uh, gosh, you have a lot of really good, cool, awesome um, opinions that could shake a couple of trees, I think, when we when we get into it. And I do want to talk about your role as board chair at Lindenwood, but we're here to talk about what you do, what Top Gun Ventures LLC does. So let's start there. What do you do at Top Gun and how do you do it? Sure. Well, again, thank you, Joe, for the opportunity. Top Gun Ventures is a national retained executive search firm. Um, and we have uh, six partners throughout the country. Um, and and, and our, our business model is a bit different than most other executive search firm business models um, with respect to how we go about the process. And I want to put my conversation in context here. I mean, there's a lot of good people in this business and in this industry that that's doing good things. But what I'm going to be talking about today is how broken the executive search model is in supporting um, all industries, including higher education, and we can get into the details of, of that. Um, Wait, did you say broken? Yikes! I did, yes. <laughs> All right, you're going to have to tell us what that means. Sure. Well, uh, let, me, let me give you some, some data points first, because I think it will help answer that question. Former CEO of one of the top retained search firms in the world, a few years ago, did a research, an internal research study within, in, within his own firm. Um, and so he had his people go look at 20,000 executive searches to find out where those candidates were and if they were still with the company that they had recruited them into. Interestingly enough, the researchers came back and the data basically said 40 percent of the candidates that they had recruited in the client companies were no longer there within 18 months. They were gone. 
And, uh-huh. and, and I, I, I mean, I jokingly say, but I'm very serious when I say this. I mean, what other business or industry do you know that fails 40% of the time that's still in business? Well, let's start the insanity. <laughs> Unless you're a baseball player batting that's 333, right? right? Mm-hmm. So then we get into the question, well, you know, why is that? I mean, why is the, the, the model broken? What's the processes that, that, that they go through to, to make it broken? And interestingly enough, if you track the history of retained executive search, it was actually founded back in the 1950s, so 70 plus years ago. And I think if all of us in this industry were honest with ourselves, we would all say that we really haven't changed our business model or our processes other than the fact that, you know, we now have better, greater technologies to use in which to identify potential candidates. Um, Are you saying that we have trouble telling ourselves the truth, Don, that that executive search is broken? You can't handle the truth. (laughs) What I'm saying, Joe, is that um, if, if this was the Wizard of Oz and the curtain is pulled back, people would be surprised in terms of what goes on behind closed doors. And what I mean by that, and, and this is part of the reason why ex- the executive search model is broken, particularly as it relates to higher ed, uh, a partner will typically come and sell you. They'll develop the relationship and sell you and book the search. Then they take that search back and most firms, whether they're small, medium or large, have junior research people that are typically reaching out and contacting potential candidates. Now, they have great databases, great in terms of of quantity. I question the quality quite a bit because you have a lot of active candidates always looking for the next job or opportunity in those databases. True. True. And I, I I do know this, right, um, because I've talked to a number of search firm representatives from search firms in higher ed, and that is pretty typical of the model, right? You start a fir- you start a search, you get a call out from some managing partner. They say, hey, we're going to be this uh, junior researcher, so-and-so is going to be leading this search, and then we're just going to spam you with a bunch of candidates until you maybe pick one. And so you're not... I, I guess you're not getting the, uh, not, I don't know if it's attention, but you're not getting the expertise of the person who's the partner in that. You're getting quantity, not necessarily quality. Well, and as a part of that process and why I say it's broken, if, if, uh, if the partners made that call to you specifically as a potential candidate, they can articulate that opportunity and they can sell you on that opportunity. Whereas contrasted to a junior research person who may not know the client, doesn't have the business skills, can't articulate the opportunity, uh, you may lose interest in that call and discussion very, very quickly. And that's really where the rubber meets the road. And that's kind of our secret sauce at Top Gun Ventures and that we don't have any support staff. It's the partners within Top Gun that does the entire search from A to Z in terms of raw research, in terms of contacting potential candidates, in terms of evaluating them, managing the client, and getting them to the to the goalposts, basically. So when we spoke um, the first time, because I, I said, Don, you know, you got to come on, you got to come on that up, and you got to talk about this because not a lot of people know this um, or even have thought about it. They just kind of go, you know we go through the motions. There's executive search firms in really all industries and you kind of go through the motions and nobody goes, Hey, could this be done a different way? And you've kind of found a different way to do it. And you said something um, that really resonated with me, by the way, when you said higher ed search is broken, I said, Oh, say that on the podcast and tell me why. Uh, But you, you talk about getting high level candidates and what saying that we're going to get him, we're going to put him in there and a hundred percent of the time we're going to be involved and we're going to get you the candidate that you want or, or else. I mean, you talked about this hundred percent thing that you have. Right. Yeah. Well, the traditional broken search model offers a one year guarantee on every candidate that they recruit or put into their client company. 
Um, we, on the other hand, changed that guarantee 20 years ago in 2002 when I developed uh, Top Gun Ventures. Uh, I had worked previously under the traditional search model. You know, I had 14 research people supporting me. I was doing 30 plus searches a year. It's impossible to do that many and do them all right. Mm. So when we changed the model, we changed it, uh, not only our process, but we told our partners, when we do a search, you're doing everything, all right? And, and, and so today, if you look at our history and, 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 uh, and our data, we get them all completed successfully. But more importantly, we're recruiting game changers. These are people that can... Uh, that that strive in turbulent times that can that can uh, maneuver in 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 transformational business cycles but we started offering a 100% guarantee rather than a 1% one, a 1 year guarantee and that 100% guarantee what percent it, guarantee 100% 100% I just happen to have that button by the way all the way until they achieve the business goals and objectives that they were hired to achieve which which is just uh, a completely different uh, service offering than 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 our competition. And, and and to add to that, you know, I don't care if you're selling dishwashers, wash machines, or or retained executive search. When you change your one year guarantee to a one hundred percent guarantee or warranty, boy, does it change your mindset in terms of how you go about identifying and evaluating and recruiting candidates because. We're not in the business of redoing searches. Nailed it. Yeah. I, I Do you have, uh, the question just hit me sideways, but you talked about the partners doing everything. When you went out to find partners, because you, you, I'm sure you didn't start with as many as you had and you added them over time. Mm -hmm. Did you pull from higher ed executive search and have people who said, you know what? I don't want to do everything. I'm not used to doing everything. This is too much for me. Or do they go, you know what? You're right. That is broken. I, I see this value proposition. I want to be part of the change. Great question. Um, out of six partners, including myself, only one of those partners we recruited out of one of the major international search firms. All the other ones we brought in and trained under our business model, under our processes, um, but the unique thing about all of our partners is they're all former executives. They have the business experience and backgrounds from startup to the Fortune 500. They've all had profit and loss responsibility, uh, and they've all been great leaders. And, and, and you know, I've often said I'd rather be lucky than good. <laughs> um, we, we've got just incredible partners who take what we and they do extremely seriously. We have to buy, buy that 100% guarantee. But, but here's the other thing. Most of the, the traditional broken search model, and it's been like this since the 1950s, mm. when, they're, when they're retained to conduct a search, I mean, the key thing is let's get the search done and hope they stay for a year. So it's a very short-term accountability mm -hmm. on anybody's part. And when we changed our model in 2002, we finally put a stake in the ground and said, look, we don't have to do this. We can keep doing the same thing. We can keep scaling the business and, and, and bring in more junior researchers and we just continue selling. And that's how you scale in this business, which is why the industry's never changed. Mm. Right? Yes. I mean, it's sales 101. Bring yep. in people to support the partners who's going out and booking the revenue and bringing it back and, and letting others, uh, work on it. So you've been working doing this work for like 35 years. You've got six partners. You've, um, I don't know how many searches you filled or if you happen to know off the top of your head, I'm sure hundreds, oh, if hundreds. not thousands. Yeah. And, um, you also kind of double as a, a board chair at Lindenwood university and understand the complexities and the issues of running an institution of higher education today. It's, you know, you, I know you're well versed in this. You, we see institutions closing. We see a lot of um, reduced tenures for presidents. It used to be that it was close to a decade. Now it's a little less than five years. Um, you see a lot of movement. You see controversy, um, failed financials. And you go, what is the advice to a board chair 
or other board members out there? What what is it that they need to know about executive search and finding the right leader? Well, first of all, and again, great question, Joe. First of all, you know, if you appoint a search committee, make sure that you've got the right people with the right backgrounds asking the right questions on that search committee. And I say that because I, I, I had a call recently from a board member uh, from another institution um, wanting some insight in terms of how to go about doing a president search. And unfortunately, this board member had never been in a senior leadership position, had never recruited a president or a CEO. So really knew very little about not only how to go about it, but what's that great game-changing president even look like, right? And um, so, so make sure that you've got the right people on, on the, the, the search committee. Um, you know, today, you know, higher ed, um, much like many industries, is, is in a transformational period. Um, you know, presidents are moving from one institution to another. Uh, higher ed search firms that specialize in higher ed have been extremely busy. Um, are we recycling the same candidates? In many cases, you are. All you have to do is look at the backgrounds of these presidents. Yeah. I, and, you know, that goes back to the point you made about executive search firms having databases of people and recycling and recycling and they're moving and they're moving. And you go, who? And you use the term game changer twice so far. And so that's, I wouldn't, you know, normally when I'm in my day to day, I don't use the term game changer that often. But maybe, I could go months without using that, but you've used it twice in this episode. Why? What does game changer mean? And, and why is that important when we, t when we take that back to the skill set a board needs to look for in a president? Mm -hmm. Well, I think boards, first of all, need to look at both traditional as well as non-traditional candidates. Uh, non-traditional being uh, individuals like our president here at Lindenwood, who spent, you know, 30 plus years at, at IBM. And I will tell you, I mean, in the 38 years that I've been in this business, I have, I've never recruited anyone from IBM. Um, no particular reason, but but it just, it, it never fit the searches that, that we worked on. Um, uh, but, but, you know, boards really have to spend a significant amount of time thinking about where the institution is at and where they wanna go. So what's the end game and then let's re-engineer backwards to determine what are the skill sets, the background and experience that you need in this new president that's going to get you to the end game. If you reverse engineer it, I feel like you're going to come up with an answer different than what you went into it thinking. You know, the and I told I, I told you this story. I want to tell it again because I don't think I've told it on the podcast. Um, you know, Don, I spent 15 years in for-profit higher education, which in many cases, uh, those folks who have worked in nonprofit, maybe in the past, not so much now, said, ooh, those bad for-profit folks, they just, you know, tried to take money from everybody and not educate students, which of course was false. But, um, but I did learn business very well, but I came from a sector that was kind of shunned. So I went to this interview before Lindenwood, um, much before actually for a president a position at a community college in Chicago. And I get into this search and there's like seven people. It's during COVID. So I'm on Zoom and I'm so excited to get in there and talk. And the first lady, she says, the first question, and it's not even a question, she says, so it seems as if you have worked in for-profit higher education. And I went, I said to her, is that a question? And from that moment, I knew the interview was over because it, it was a statement of qualification. Now you extend that out now and you say there's more, more presidents that have backgrounds outside of higher education. And um, do you think that's common? Do you think higher ed is coming around to the fact that we need to look at alternative candidates or are we still baked into this assimilation, col uh, assimilation culture that it's dean to you know instructor professor to dean to vp of academics to provost to president and oh by the way the most important important thing you have to manage is financials and you haven't been trained to do that uh, without a doubt uh higher ed has not moved that much in terms of moving the needle going from continuing to hire the traditional higher ed person who spent 10 15 20 30 years 
to, to, to transitioning to finding non-traditional candidates that come from business. And, um, and, and, and you're right. I mean, when you stop and think about, and this is, this is not, you know, negative towards the people who have grown up in higher ed, but, uh, if everybody's honest with, with, with each other, higher ed, whether you're at a college or university, I mean, you're here to, uh, educate students, right? Yes. But as we all know, over the last few years, everybody's enrollment has basically dropped. Revenues have dropped. We're in a transformational period. So, you know, if you're the president running a college or university and you've come up from, you know, faculty to, to department head, dean, you know, provost, whatever the case may be, into the president role, um, have you really ever developed a, a cabinet, a team of of game changing people? Have you ever three times he said game changer? Have you ever truly had profit and loss responsibility and understand cash flow and all the other things that that are really important in today's uh, in today's world? And at the end of the day, I mean, yes, we're running an educational institution, but it is a business no matter how you slice it. Oh, I agree. You know, I agree. I talk about it all the time. You, one thing, I, these questions hit me out of nowhere and I go, let's say for a minute that we have two higher ed institutions that look exactly the same, same programs, same problems, same people, same everything. And I take, um, I leave a, a leader who's not performing at one and I put a new tradition, non-traditional candidate at the other. Is it fair to say that people make the difference and that you can't turn the culture around if you don't have the right person leading the institution? I have a saying, Joe, it's always about the people. In fact, my business partner in Dallas and I did a survey uh, several years ago, and we, we asked a number of investors, board members, CEOs, if you were to put a percentage on, uh, let's say, a four-legged bar stool, you've got, you know, how big is the market? Um, how much capital can you throw at it? Uh, how good is the technology? Mm -hmm. And then you have the people as the fourth uh, stool of or leg of the stool. Uh, of those four things, um, wh when you look at the failures of your companies where's the biggest failure at and and 80 percent of the time it always revolved around the people you will learn by the numbers i will teach you ladies and gentlemen can i have your attention it's time for us to solve the puzzle of success in higher education get your ticket to elusian live for industry insights powerful connections and innovative solutions from March 26th through 29th, join peers from around the world in New Orleans to unlock the possibility and drive student and institutional success. Learn more and register at elive.elucian.com. It's time to level up. The beginning of a new era in higher education begins with you. Order your copy of Commencement. The beginning of a new era in higher education by Kate Colbert, Dr. Joseph Lucio, with contributions by Elvin Freitas. It's higher education's must read book of 2022. Discover how you can seize the moment to change higher education forever. Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education, now available on Amazon. For bulk orders, contact Kate, Joe, or Elvin. Love it. I love the stats that come along. And that makes us such a difference, right? Because we know higher education business models are broken. We know enrollment is a challenge. We know there's a lot of merger and acquisition talk out there. We know that there's institutions that will fail. And you just go, you're missing the right person, maybe. You're, you, know, you told me a story once of a company that you worked with where there was a gentleman at the top and he, they, they couldn't get any traction of growth. There, there were they were hampered by the strategy and they kept rotating people in and out. And then they found somebody, you find that right person, the business didn't change, the model didn't change, but the person then helped them supercharge a business. Sometimes it is a, a, about fit. And how do you know 
And how do you find the person that's the right fit if you're always looking from the same pool of folks that you looked from before? Well, you don't always look from the same pool. That's mm. that's part of the problem. That's why the the model is broken, um, uh, in my opinion. Exactly. When when we do a search, um, one of the first things we do is, is is we do a lot of raw research because we don't know everybody in the world, mm -hmm. right? If if you ask our president here at Lindenwood, you do know a lot of people. Just for it, the record, well, we do, but but but. But if you ask our president here, who we recruited um, at, at Lindenwood, if he and I had ever talked before in his entire life, he will tell you no. Mm. And and in fact, um, out of the hundreds of searches that I've done, it's it's really an interesting statistic. I've only recruited one person that I knew before. So that tells you amazing that tells you that we're in the search business and not the fetch business. Ooh, I like that. That's interesting. What does that mean exactly? Can you define? So, so somebody's going, what does that mean? The search business, not the fetch business. Well, we don't rely upon a database of potential candidates. I mean, we're doing raw research. We're, we're finding out who are those game changers in any particular industry, right? Yes. One of the things I asked you before, and I thought it was important to ask, you're talking about retained executive search and you're 100% um, a, a guarantee that you're going to get this candidate in there. They're going to stay in there and not just the year. I do know, because it's happened to some colleagues of mine, that they've gone through executive search firms before and they hit their year, or they hit that year and a half, and they end up right back in the database and be are re-recruited by the search firm that stuck them in the job in the first place. How do you, is that something that you avoid, first of all, because I think that's just an important question for the audience, because that is, seems like a bad practice, and I know it's common out there. Um, and and how do you avoid that? Well, I mean, you know, there's there's a there's a word called ethics and integrity mm. uh, and honesty. I mean, you, you know, you don't want to recruit people out of out of your client companies. I mean, that that's basically in our standard agreement letter. Um, it, it, unfortunately it does happen, but, uh, um, again, we're not looking at active candidates. We're looking at, uh, passive candidates who are doing well in their career, who in many cases, you know, could care less about getting a phone call or a LinkedIn message saying, hey, I'd like to talk to you about, uh, about a new opportunity. But again, I go back to the secret sauce of our partners making those calls and articulating the opportunity because we do get them to raise their hand and express an interest. And, and that's, that's huge in this business. Do you think, um, do you think searches can fail? You talked about board makeup or committee makeup. If you are taking a board from a nonprofit, a lot of times, and this has not talking about Lindenwood's boards, let me make that disclaimer. But I know a lot of people out there, you're talking about people that maybe don't come from business. And if they do, it's not high red related business or they're from other industries, maybe very high level. You might have some academic academics on a board. And maybe that that understanding of higher education, when you look at it from the outside and you go, oh, we really need somebody that understands the ins and outs of all of these programs and the students. Yes, you got to understand the students, but the programs and the academics, you can get really caught up in all the pomp and circumstance of an academic structure if you're not in that structure and you're looking from the outside and you look at this person who might be general business or technology and go, oh, they don't know higher ed, they're never going to make it. So you, how do you craft the right board to consider non-traditional candidates? Because I will tell you, it is not common. Right. No, I, I would agree. Well, We've done the same thing here at at, uh, at Lindenwood. Uh, not every new board member that we've recruited over the last several years, including myself, came out of higher ed, mm. right? But, you know, after being on this board for seven years, boy, have my eyes been open. I mean, I've learned a lot and I'm still learning. Um, but But I think, you know, what you have to do is you have to look outside your own box and bring in talent who have different ideas and a vision. I, you know, I go back to one of your former guests, uh, 
who I know, uh, Dr. Michael Crow, president of ASU. I mean, Epic. if you look at, 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 at Dr. Crow's background, I mean, he was a provost at Columbia University. Mm-hmm. But today, he's one of the most successful presidents most in innovative. higher education. And, and, and what are his key words in terms of building and scaling ASU? It's innovate, innovate, innovate. Yep. So I think, you know, most boards have to, again, look outside the box, bring in people that don't think the same way as everyone else. Uh, because, again, as we live in this transformational world in higher ed, you've got to have new ideas. You, I, I do want to hit this because you you talk about it of uh, the difference between executives. I, I forgot the three levels you talked about, but I think it's important for everybody to know because I did not know this. I think I knew it fundamentally, but I didn't know the names. A retained Top Gun Ventures is retained executive search. What are the difference? What are the different yeah, ones? There's really three levels of recruiting. You've got the lowest level, which is contingency recruiting firms that don't get paid a fee until they recruit someone. They typically work at the lower levels. Then you've got mid-level firms that do uh, retingency, which they get a small retainer up front, but the majority of their fee isn't paid until, again, they recruit someone. Uh, And then you have firms like Top Gun Ventures, which is only a retained executive search firm. We do only C level, you know, executive search. Mm. What do you so what what do you think higher ed institutions today, knowing all that you know about higher education, the trouble, the financial issues, marketing and enrollment issues, enrollment in general, um, you know, athletics well and the challenges that come with athletics. What do you think is a skill set? I mean, I know there's probably many, but are there some key skills that you were looking for? for Lindenwood that you think another board chair or board member out there and you go, these, these were some pretty important skills. For a president search? Yeah. yeah. They've got to be able to understand the problems of what's going on, first of all. If they don't understand, it's going to take them a long time to figure it out. Mm. So uh, they've got to be able to get their arms wrapped around the institutional's problems, the issues. They've got to be entrepreneurial. They've got to be extremely strategic. I mean, you see what's ah. going on here at Lindenwood and the things that we're doing uh, and the thinking and the vision outside the box that you, this university has never even thought of before. Yep. And, and it all comes back to the leadership and our president's team that he's developed, including yourself. So, you know, being an entrepreneur, uh, being strategic, uh, but being able to execute on the plan is really, really critical. In today's environment, you just can't cut the budget. It doesn't work. That's mm-hmm. not gonna. That's not gonna save you today. Um, you did when we were talking initially. You did put some costs to this. You said it's expensive to get a search wrong, and you put you put some numbers to this. What's the cost of a bad hire? And uh, and I want you to go through that if you would because. Um, aren't we all about show me the money? <laughs> yeah, great question. Um, you know, there's different statistics out there, but but we'll just take the the president search. Um, every mishire uh, typically will cost the university twelve to fifteen times that president's total cash compensation, which could be significant, right? Yeah. There's another number involved here, and that is if if you make a bad hire and you've got to go through this entire process, I mean, you're losing about 12 months of runway in the marketplace. Yikes! And that can kill you. Mm. That can literally put you underwater. Let me go back to the um, CEO, former CEO of one of the major retained search firms in the world. When he did the 20... uh, thousand research on the 20,000 searches. And by the way, this is an eight to $10 billion a year industry, right? So that firm uh, in that year was roughly doing about 500 million in revenue. So 40% of their searches were failed failures. Mm. The people were not there 18 months later. So if you take 40% times the 500 million, that's 200 
million dollars in retained fees that companies, colleges, universities pay down. Wow. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. A lot of money. And a lot of lost money when you make the wrong choice. So you better get it right. Find the right people on your committee at any level. Let's just be honest. And you're always going to put a committee, a hiring committee together. If you have people on that committee, they're not willing to, I don't know, consider people with um, uh, uh, non-traditional skills, then you won't end up with certain people that can really knock it out of the park. Uh, and that those are the game changers that I know all of you are looking for because you've spoken to me about some of the troubles at your universities. And boy, there are game changers out there. You just got to know how to look for them. Uh, Don, we always ask the same couple of questions to um, close out every episode. Number one, we like to give you an open mic. What do you want to say about Top Gun Ventures LLC? Is there anything that we didn't talk about today that you want to mention? Anything that's going on with your organization? Anything of note? Really just love on lo love on your hard work after yeah. all these years. And I appreciate that, Joe. The, I wanted to do this primarily just to educate people, educate board members, educate uh, presidents, and, and, and just people in general involved in, in higher education. Um, I also want to point out, you know, higher ed is going through this transformational phase, much like retail stores or the retail industry has gone through over the last five to 10 years. If you look at just the last few years, there's over 70 retail companies that have gone bankrupt mm -hmm. because their leaders couldn't, wouldn't, shouldn't, whatever the case may be, couldn't change, couldn't transform, couldn't develop a new strategy. And some of those companies are, are, are well-known household names like Toys R Us, yep. Payless Shoes, Sears, beauty brands, they're all gone. Ah! And, you know, my fear is that, you know, and, and we see it every day and every week. I mean, colleges and universities are closing their doors or they're being acquired for, you know, low valuations or whatever yep. the case may be. Hmm. Do you think executive search will go away or you think there'll always be a need for it? And and the second, um, I know I, this isn't actually the ending question, but you made me think of it. Are higher ed institutions willing to put their money where their mouth is to say, we need a great game changing candidate. We know it's going to cost us and we're willing to bring on a re retained executive search firm. Or do they go, you know what? Budgets are tight. We're just going to go and see who we get. Yeah, my fear is that um, I I think it's 50-50. I, I think there's there's still a number of institutions and and board members uh, that that recognize uh, how useful you know executive search can be. Um, I think there's others that um, um, you know are are uh, maybe not as decisive, uh, and and I think they will suffer at the end of the day. Um, Cause it's, it's a, it's a, it's always a tough thing to, to, you know, how do you have the money to put on a search with a little uncertainty um, of finding the right person? Is that less expensive in the moment? Cause in the moment it's more expensive, but in the long run, it's way more expensive to go and find the wrong person. Yeah. Not only do they not hit revenue goals typically, but there's like a culture ruining that can happen by having the wrong person. It takes you a year, sometimes longer to build back out of a bad culture. Right. Well, the, the bigger question is, you know, can you afford not to, yeah. to do the search? And, uh, and you're right. I mean, you know, our fees are, you know, a third of the cash co total compensation of, of where we recruit and it's paid on a, on a retainer basis. But I, I have this saying, um, and this started out years ago when I was doing a lot of work uh, supporting venture capitalists and private equity firms and their portfolio companies. And by the way, one of the reasons I changed the whole business model was that my track record in working with these venture capitalists was no better than theirs. I mean, mm -hmm. they got one out of 10 startup companies to a successful exit event, either an IPO or a buyout. And I took equity in, in a number of these companies. And when they lost, uh, I lost money. Yeah. Right? And, and, but yet VCs, the VC model is, you know, they can hit a grand slam home run on one out of 10 and they make 
you know, their institutional investors happy. Yep. Uh, the other nine can hit a single, a double or fail. But I, I kept thinking there's got to be a better way. If we can help them just get from one out of 10 to two out of 10, mm -hmm. I, I mean, that's a home run right there. So that's that. That's what got our thinking uh, years ago. But, but I have this saying uh, to, to board members, uh, you know, don't think about the candidate, the new president that you want to recruit. I mean, although that's an important topic, but the biggest decision that you've got to make is which search firm you use, because if you get that wrong, you're probably going to get the candidate wrong as well. Epic. Don, uh, closing question. What do you see for the future of higher education in general? I certainly see a uh, consolidation. Um, um, I, I uh, certainly uh, higher ed is leaning more and more towards uh, online educational programs, certifications. Um, you know, it, it's not <laughs> here at Lindenwood. I mean, you know, we don't have students standing in line to get into the uh, into the door anymore, uh, as most schools don't. Um, and that's why, that's why you've got to have the right leadership um, uh, to focus on enrollment, to, to focus on um, uh, strategy and, and, and to change like the rest of the world is changing today. And higher ed in many instances is not built to change. We have very deep infrastructures of the way we do things and committees and this and that, and even getting some line of a of a catalog change can sometimes go through 10 committees and you go forget it you know i'll find another way to do it and who who hurts in the end it's the student you got to break some glass every now and then you got to be willing to bring in a leader that's going to break a break a piece of glass and shake things up a little bit uh, because that's what uh, businesses that grow rapidly do they're disrupting and higher ed has been really short on disruption uh, but we're not short on very knowledgeable retained search executives like Don Tuttle, nor are we short on amazing board of director uh, chairmen like Don Tuttle. Don, it's been an honor to have you on the podcast today. Yeah, no, thank you, Joan. I just, you know, want to add one thing uh, Do is, it. is um, you know, as, as, as boards go out and, and look at, uh, you know, search firms, and I'm, I'm not here to sell Top Gun Ventures um, uh, at, at all. Uh, I'm here to educate and just, you know, um, sort of open uh, open the door here in terms of how uh, how our industry works the the good the bad and the ugly but uh, uh, in a video I did a couple of years ago I mean everybody's reputation is at stake today particularly yeah. board members so if you get you know if you're doing a board or a president search and that president doesn't work out I mean it, it all comes back to you know, the search committee and the board that made the decision um, and, and, you know, ended up having a bad hire. So that's that's all I'm trying to do is to educate and, and so that we don't make this mistake many more times in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, you heard him today. He is a man of a great wisdom, I know, because I get to talk to him all the time. He's Don Total. He's co-founder and managing partner of Top Gun Ventures, LLC, and chairman of the board at Lindenwood University. Don, I know uh, you're here to educate, but I will tell you, if higher ed, and it is, executive search is broken, what are we going to do to fix it? And do you want to be part of the solution? And if you do, Don is not a bad guy to talk to. So, Don, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Did you have a good time? It's been a pleasure, Joe. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just ed upped. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for some um, um, amazing news. It's time to work together to solve the puzzle of success in higher education. Belusian Live returns to New Orleans from March 26th through 29th to help you unlock possibility for your institution. And yes, the EdUp experience will be there recording live. Industry leaders from all across the world are converging to discover new insights, game-changing solutions, and powerful connections, all with the goal of addressing higher ed's greatest opportunities and biggest challenges. You do not want to miss Elucian Live. Learn more and secure your seat today at elive.elucian.com. It will be um, um, amazing. You know that the world of higher education is experiencing evolutions and revolutions. You want to be part of the progress. Commencement 
the beginning of a new era in higher education with insights from more than 100 college and university presidents. We'll show you how. Get your copy of Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education now on Amazon right away. We think you're going to love it. It's amazing.